what? I'm not a pro. I'm a home cook. I want to make sure I'm on point for the rest of these components I got to make today. I'm not going to blow this one iota. If you think I'm going to screw up, stick around. This is hard boiled down. I'm starting off my Monday morning window by making the grapefruit dashi for the scallop dish, finishing up the trim oil, which will be needed this afternoon, and I'll be taking the pine oil I made yesterday and turning that into pine noodle udon. First thing I need to add will be about an entire container of grapefruit juice. This is unsweetened white grapefruit juice, so no added preservatives, added flavors aside from the actual grapefruit juice itself. So this should taste delicious. I also need grapefruit zest to go into this concoction. In a 2009 Huffington Post interview, Chef Wiley Dufresne describes his cuisine as a quote, myriad of sciences, physics, biology, and a lot of chemistry. We use existing information about the science of cooking to gain a greater understanding of what's going on when we cook our food, close quote. These traditional sciences have been the backbone of great food throughout the course of human history. It might be overkill for a home cook like myself to be making 11 components just for two dishes, but if you look at the big picture, each one brings understanding not only what goes into our food, but how complex flavors develop from simple ingredients. From traditional science to mad science, I now try some of the techniques Chef Dufresne and his brigade used during WD-50's existence in New York City. Many in the culinary world call this cuisine a form of alchemy or molecular gastronomy, the latter term Dufresne rejected outright. But when I think about it... In a way, it's almost like taking Julia Child and marrying Bill Nye to his philosophies. I don't think I'm going to use that in the final cut. I had to. That line was too good to pass up. So this recipe calls for about three-ish grams of agar that needs to be mixed into here. Here being a small saucepan with one cup of the grapefruit dashi. So this needs to be mixed up and brought to a boil before simmering for about five minutes. At the same time, I need to get this to 140 degrees. The combined mixture will cool and set in two sheet pans for about one hour. In that time, the agar will thicken and clarify the dashi eventually producing a finished product, clean in appearance, and rich in flavor. On the subject of adding flavor, yesterday's pine oil is today's pine needle udon. Got my water, got my salt in here. One, two, three, four. See, I have the last of it right there. Some extra measure. Throw some bread flour into the food processor, and away we go. Get that process, and while that's going on, I'm going to slowly add my mixture. This is an incredibly tough dough to begin with, so Japanese tradition says you have to knead a dough like this with your feet. So I gotta stomp on this. Just like wine. Huh? Just like wine. Yeah, just like wine. So I stomped away, making sure to fold the dough over 10 times in the process. It took a while, long enough to bore our dog to sleep. While Mocha napped and the udon rested for three hours, I break up the semi-solidified dashi and strain it through cheesecloth. It underwent this process twice because my first strain was cloudier than the recipe recommended. Now back to the udon. The rested dough goes through a pasta roller until it's less than a quarter of an inch thick. If you don't have one, a large wooden rolling pin will work just fine. Slice the dough into eighth inch wide noodles, dust with a little flour, and cover. With the udon and dashi finished and resting in the refrigerator, I move on to dessert. The root beer chew. Hands down the one I don't want to f up. Step one, make a simple glucose syrup. Salvage this, I can salvage this, I can salvage this. Ninety. That's probably about as good as I'm gonna get. If you remember the four rules Katie and I abide by in the kitchen from the first episode, 
That's how you handle number three. That was close. All right, let's get this mixed up. The glucose syrup gets some sugar and heavy cream, which I ran short on. Half and half to the rescue. Remember those cherries I quickly pureed up on prep day one? They're put to good use now. One little splash of root beer and a quick taste test to stir up some childhood memories. Mm, let's cook. As the mixture heats up on the stove, I pour some chocolate chips in a microwave safe bowl for melting, but not before committing the childhood no-no. 36 years old and I still love to eat chocolate chips out of a bag. Can't stop me now, mom. Once the chips are melted, I add black cherry and root beer flavoring, red food coloring, bloomed silver sheet gelatin, agar, citric acid, and pectin. The latter ingredients, when blended in with my creamy root beer and cherry mixture, will help solidify everything once pressing the refrigerator. Not quite the one cup hot water, stir two minutes, and one cup cold water directions I'm used to when making any flavored gelatin dessert, but I'm never dealing with anything this complex, or mind bending for that matter. Okay, talking head persona, how do you make shrimp noodles? Simple. I'm going to take that bowl of shrimp and this little container of ingredients, which includes nothing more than salt, cayenne pepper, and a compound called, called transglutaminase, which is essentially meat glue. If you haven't heard of this before, they can take this enzyme and convert it into, well, they can take this enzyme, sprinkle it on two pieces of meat, and essentially bind it together. Pause it. Bring it to me. I need to educate myself. Now, talking head me wasn't far off but it's more than gluing macaroni to a paper plate during pre-K art class. Meat glue, also known as transglutaminase when pronounced correctly, is a natural microbial enzyme that can bind certain proteins together. While it has other uses in the kitchen, such as making shrimp noodles, it provides the ability to fuse different cuts of meat together and make it appear that it's whole muscle. While this may sound like a new scientific innovation in the culinary world, it's actually been around for quite a while. Two products in particular that's used in, chicken nuggets and imitation crab. The first one is quite simple, but you don't expect anyone downing a small deep fried chunk of chicken to believe it came from the same part of the bird when it was chopped up. Then again, that thought never crossed my mind when I was six, 16, 26, or even 36 years old. It's called fast food for a reason. As for imitation crab, I've had it before as a kid, and it was all right. But on the whole, crab is one of those special occasion things for me much like this WD-50 dinner. Until now, I never really read what goes into imitation crab. The nice thing is nowadays, most supermarket websites list ingredients and nutrition facts for most items they carry. One brand of imitation crab in particular contains the following. Alaskan Pollock, water, egg whites, cornstarch, sugar, and sorbitol, a sugar alcohol. You may think that's it, but wait, there's more. Imitation crab also contains less than 2% of the following king crab meat, refined anchovy and sardine oil, natural and artificial flavoring derived from several crustaceans, modified tapioca starch, sea salt, yam flour, and last but certainly not least, bunch of chemical additives to help that product keep its shape, preserve freshness, and add flavor from the time the pollock is caught to the point it hits your store shelves as a mutated form so far different from what it started life as. You can bet transglutaminase is in this section, despite nowhere to be found in the ingredients. When you see imitation crab next to the seafood case full of fresh king crab legs, the first thing that pops out is the price. One is much, much cheaper than the other, but is it just as good for you? While the imitation crab has less calories, fat, sodium, and cholesterol per three ounce serving, it's loaded in carbohydrates. The king crab is pure protein, which is rich in nutrients and omega-3 fatty acids, both of which are good for your body. One way or another, much of the food we consume is processed. The biggest difference comes down to the options behind the processing. The convenience route provided through mass production means more ingredients and less nutritional value at a cheaper price. The inconvenient route, mainly at home, provides a better nutritional value and flavor, but at the cost of time and a few extra bucks. One might be good for the wallet, but the other one is much better for the body. I won't go any further, but I'll just say this. I'm not even curious to find out what the hell is in the Impossible Burger. I just want to get back to making shrimp noodles. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it through this sieve to get it a fine consistency. The instructions stated coarse mesh, 
but this was the closest thing I had. So I chewed up about 30 minutes of my life purifying the shrimp concoction into a very, very fine pate. Done with it now? Nope. Into a piping bag and yet into another home hack. On the stove itself, I have a vat of hot water setting around 136 degrees. It's about 154 right now. And then to the right, I have an immersion circulator that has a water bath going at 136, which is the recommended technique needed to make shrimp noodles. In about a minute or so, I'm going to shut that off. I'm going to give these noodles a test run. By this point, the transglutaminase has created new bonds within the shrimp proteins. All that's left now is to extrude the pate into a warm water bath and let it cook for two minutes. I'll be honest, this is one of the coolest things I've ever done with food. It may not look appetizing now, but when it's snipped into edible segments and cooled into an ice bath, it looks exactly as it sounds. If you ever consider doing a low carb diet like keto yet love pasta, this technique might be up your alley. Everything's out. I'm gonna shut this off and turn that off too. And so in theory, you can cook the shrimp noodles over the stove in a pot, but you have to be very, very picky with the temperature and it's gonna be a little higher than normal. All right, 250 grams. So we got enough for uh, tomorrow night. And last but not least, I'm just gonna take a little bit of the shrimp oil. I'm gonna dress these bad boys right now. And in the fridge they go, and I am done. Might have taken me nine hours across two days, but everything that I need to knock off this WD-50 dinner tomorrow night is ready to go. I hope you tune in next week to see if I have a success or it falls flat in my face. Until next time, stay healthy and stay hungry. Thank you for watching this episode of Hard Boiled Down. If you enjoyed today's content, please like the video and share it with your friends. Join the official YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Instagram.